Um, now it's uh, my pleasure to welcome um, again officially Elizabeth Schub, Professor Elizabeth Schub, um, to our session. And Elizabeth is a distinguished, distinguished professor of sociology at Lancaster University, uh, where she was also previously a deputy director of the Center of um, the Study of Environmental Change and the Center um, for Science Studies. Um, she's also a fellow of the British Academy and a visiting professor at the University of Helsinki. Um, Elizabeth has published extensively on social practice theory uh, in a wealth of, of books and journal articles. Um, and she, there she's focusing on issues such as energy, mobility, health, um, and also demand most recently. And some of her most recent books there um, are Connecting Practices and Conceptualizing Demand. Um, and there's a chance she will be talking about some of them today. Elizabeth currently heads the flexibility theme in the Center for Research into Energy Demand Solutions, um, connecting some of the topics that I mentioned earlier. So uh, now, without further ado, I hand the floor to you, Elizabeth, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for joining okay, us thanks. today. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to share the screen, I hope. There, is that good? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, two things, the flexibility theme, I'm not actually heading that, that's run by Jacopo, and um, I'm Elizabeth Shove, so I'll just get that in to begin with. Um, right, so this is quite a daunting task, because there's quite a lot of you out there, and well, what does practice theory have to say to transitions theory? I have taken as being the kind of topic or theme for today and that's not a new issue so there's quite a lot of work gone on around that kind of interface and what you're going to hear is my take on it so you don't have to agree with me I mean it's just like what I think about these issues and why I think what I do but I can't do that I mean some of you have I don't know really quite what your backgrounds are so I'm going to sort of go gently or at least I think I'm going to go gently but it is quite an abstract theoretical kind of talk. So I'm not going to say much actually about sustainability or specific examples or, or anything. So you'll have to put up with that basically. Um, but what I'm gonna do is, is sort of describe something of what I take to be the intellectual histories of transition theories and practice theories and say a little bit about the implications of those histories for the way that they conceptualize key issues like agency and change and these sorts of things. And then, and then think about whether they're in, at all compatible or completely opposed in the way they think about these things or what the future combinations might be or does it make sense? Anyway, we'll come on to that later on. Uh, but, but that's why I've got the question mark at the end of the title. Does it, is it actually possible to conceptualize transitions in classic transition theory sense in practice, or is that an impossible task? So that's, that's where we're gonna go. So, so this is my interpretation of the kind of intellectual ancestries. Um, transition theories, which I guess you're probably more familiar with, has it have their roots because there's not one but they have their roots in a kind of field of innovation studies you know economics as well rogers s curves and so on blended with science and technology studies so i if i went somebody said where does this stuff come from that's what i'd, I'd kind of point in those directions if somebody equally says, well, what about what we now call practice theories? What, what's their history? Where do they come from? What, what legacy, what ideas do they build on? Uh, I'd say it's a bit more social theory in general. I'd say Gittins or Bourdieu and structuration theory are really important. But I'd also say material, I've got material culture, but it could be science and technology studies too, but it's a bit, perhaps a bit more anthropological, a bit more material culture than sort of the 
economics innovation end of science and technology studies. But there's some there's some overlaps and sources and resources that they both have in common. And I'll come on to that and the implications of that later on. But I would, I'm also going to make a lot of the differences. I think there are fundamental differences in the way these different traditions conceptualize change in society and in the material world, how they think about agency and the part of individuals play in any of that. Certainly different in ways of conceptualizing policy or policy relevance. Um, I think really fundamental difference in terms of the kind of theory of being and how you understand society as a multi-level sort of structure or a flat, a flat ontology, as they say, a flat arrangement. Uh, I think they're really different in how they conceptualize space and time. Some one, you know, well, we'll come on to that. Um, but despite that, I think there are some interesting points of commonality that have to do with ideas about evolution, with ideas about prefiguring or the shaping of futures. I think both are quite capable of dealing with the large scale, although some people say practice theories aren't. And I think they're both, you, you couldn't accuse either of them of being of offering a single causal explanation for the world. So there are some points of connection, but what that means, we'll, we'll come on to see. So I'm gonna start with my take on transition theories and with a picture that you've seen a thousand times before, um, which is Frank Gill's kind of representation of a multi-level model of a regime where there are different, uh, these shapes I think are really useful. That's why I've highlighted them in color. There's a kind of configuration of infrastructure, technological knowledge, market use, and that, that makes a kind of world, a regime, into which new innovations arrive. And that's all these little flock of arrows at the bottom. And then as they take hold, it's all a bit of a mystery how they take hold, but anyway, as they take hold, and part of their taking hold involves the reshaping of the relations between those dimensions of the shape on the left and it ends up being different as those innovations take hold and it becomes the shape on the right. Now that reshaping is classically understood in terms of different agents, different policy organizations, whatever, pushing and pulling and incumbents being edged out and making way for new as the strategic niche becomes normal and as oh you know innovations fail and drop out so they're all not jostling for position exactly but but there's some kind of pushing and pulling going on and and it's through that that you get a reconfiguration of the shape fine and that's that's if it's big is called a transition hence transition theory i in my account now there's nothing that's it you know that's that's how we where where we're going to start from but there are some obvious issues with this. Um, one is one is that there's never like what's the temporal and spatial scale of any of this? You'll notice the diagram doesn't have that on it. But if you took one technology, if you took something like air conditioning, if you're interested in sustainability, air conditioning is a massively problematic technology. It, it became normal over several generations. It's relatively recent. It's you know one of the single biggest causes of carbon emissions and electricity consumption in the world. And but the shape of the the innovation and landscape and regime and so on is different. Was different. Still is different in Britain or in Tokyo or Singapore or Milan. So what does the original map show? What what's is it a nation state? Is it a village? <laughs> what is the scale here spatially? That's one point. And the second is that it's obviously not the same. Like the, the shape is not the same in different countries at different points in time. So at a minimum, we have multiple layers. That's why I've shown these in transparent colours, overlapping that make up, I mean, you know, like when you talk about air conditioning, was was it? Was it America that was like the niche of the world? <laughs> Did it spread out then? 
is that what's shown in the arrows or is this a complete misreading? Anyway, I think there's some basic issues which I've hinted at here about how many multiple forms of this diagram should there be? And also really what is the time scale or what are the multiple time scales? So the time scale in of air conditioning becoming normal in America is nothing like the time scale of air conditioning becoming normal in India, for example. So, so these are things that are not addressed, perhaps quite rightly not addressed in this kind of schematic figure. But I think um, it would be unfair to say that these aren't issues that what happened, I mean, of course they figured in more recent discussions of transition theory. And I've taken the next slide actually from one of your uh, previous uh, webinars. This is a picture from Johan Schott where he's had a go, well, he's made it more colorful, but he's also had to go at kind of patching or plastering on many, many transitions on top of each other, hence all these little colored arrows going this way and that, to capture a kind of era or periodicity of transitions and deep transitions. Um, so I don't actually think the diagram tells you very much, to be honest. Um, I have no idea what the directionality is. Um, I think it's the same diagram, but with more arrows in it or differently arranged arrows in it. So although there's an effort to engage with what I've mentioned, I don't think it's that satisfactory. At least there's a proper history here, but what, how does that work out? That's all complicated. Anyway. The second, like, like our next point I'd like to kind of make from the original diagram is and this is the link to talking a bit about social practices, is the where user practices, where practices fit in. And they only fit in in this little purple box here. So markets and user practices are there. So you can't, it's not just practices, it's specifically user practices, and they just have one little role in this total scheme. So we don't have technology as practice, we don't have policy as practice, we don't have industrial networks and their practices or anything like that. Infrastructural practices, no, it's just the market, it's just the user, which is an individual, an individual user consumer. So there's a kind of specific role both for individual agency and for practices in this representation. So I'm going to do a bit of a summary before I move on. Um, I think, and this is my take, you might disagree, the transition series take a technology like air conditioning or something like it, or many technologies, as the central unit of what's followed. That's what the arrows show across the page. Change is a result of the alignment or not of many different actors. There can be radical breaks and disruptions. In fact, that's of great interest. Those breaks and disruptions involve the reshuffling of incumbents and new entrants and so on. And there's a kind of temporal sequence, which is a steady state disturbance, steady state again. That's the kind of representation of that, of that image. Becoming large is, is, you know, as you move up Roger's S curve, which is what the, what the kind of arc shows on this classic diagram, um, but without any geographical scale or temporal scale. It's clear there are many sites of individual agency, and that I think is a real strength. So it's not just the economy, it's also all the other kind of considerations. But policy is in there as a, an external force shaping the trajectory of those innovations. For me, some of the puzzles are no spatial scale, no, not really very explicitly a historical view, apart perhaps from Johan, but that's a bit unclear. Um, it's not very clear how many of these innovation journeys combine. And I don't actually know what's meant really by user practices. So I'm gonna leave that part there and then I'm gonna do something a little bit similar for practice theory, but very much from my point of view, and then see where we go in mixing these traditions. So it is from my point of view, and I'm just showing you some of the things I've written as well. So I'm not claiming that I stand for all of practice theory, but for me, Practice theories are completely different from transition theories because they take practices and not technologies 
also so technical systems as the central unit of inquiry, conceptualization and analysis. Some of that earlier work deals with like innovations in Nordic walking or how did showering every day become normal, these kinds of examples. Um, and that's led some people to say practice theory is great, but it can't deal with economies or financial markets. But I think more recent work has, you know, put the end to that kind of criticism. And I'll say a bit more about that next. For me, I think it still makes sense to borrow Reckwitz's ideas about sort of practices being made of ongoing integrations of material confidence, meaning elements. That's much uh, simplified and much abused actually as an idea, but nonetheless, I still think there's something in there. Um, the elements of practices shape each other recursively. There are bundles and complexes of practices and multiple circuits of reproduction. So this is actually has the seeds of a very broad and quite complex kind of social theory, a theory about the social world and how it works, including materiality. And so here's some ideas about materials. Um, so competences, meanings, these are the different elements, how they get integrated to make one functioning practice, how the elements split apart, how practices disappear. I think there's an account of how practices disappear that transitions theory doesn't doesn't have. Um, recognizing that the elements have lives of their own, but they're not independent of their enactment. And then the sort of little spotty diagrams show individual carriers holding a circular spot of practices together or departing from it or changing the mix of practices in society. The other diagrams indicate that with each iteration, the elements of a practice change to some extent. And funny little overlapping transparent layers at the bottom suggests that the world is kind of carved up and dynamic and changing all the time. If, if this was a map, kind of spatial map, then in some places, like in the middle, many elements overlap and, and layer on top of each other. So that permits some practices to happen. And in other parts of the world, those same practices could not happen because those elements are not there. So I think we have a much more sort of spatial geographical take on change and the possibility of practice than um, might be the case with the transitions theory. Next, um, and again, this was a collection by me and Ted and, and Alison a while ago now, we began to think a bit more about how practices are knitted together as the cover of the book suggests and how connections between practices are made, how ideas and discourses thread through each other, how general understandings of the way the world might work are realized in specific practices, how infrastructures and materiality hold certain ways of living in place and constitute the sort of background mesh or fabric of daily life. Um, there's a really nice chapter in the book on power and practice. So we, we began to open up the discussion away from individual practices to think about the nexus of practices. And, and that was an edited book and that set, that set the scene for quite a lot of new ideas and thinking um, in 2017. Including or picking up some of these points about people being not, um, not exactly independent agents of change in their own right, but people as the nodes, the points where practices connect um, and transform each other as well. And recognizing that people are the, as the carriers of practice, depending on which combinations of practices they carry, can also be transformative of the lives of those practices. So if lots of people stopped playing football, football would not exist as a practice or not as a practice that we know. It changes all the time as new recruits come in and so on and so forth. So there's, there's plenty of good ideas to work with. I mean, a great big bucket of ideas to work with, really. Um, but there were still these sort of niggling complaints that what we needed was more, you know, bigger ideas, like big ideas like economics or transitions theory or something like that to really capture issues of sustainability or change in the world or the global order or big politics. Um, 
I, and this is just my kind of intellectual history, I thought that's, that's wrong. I think practice theory can deal with these topics um, and can engage with processes of accumulation, how practices add to each other, how they break apart. Um, so this long list here is some terms that Ted Chatsky wrote about, um, which is all about how practices hang together. So, you know, that S curve is just one, if it, if it is one at all, of many um, sets of processes. So in this new book, Connecting Practices, which came out right at the end of last year, although it's got this year as the publication date, um, I, I take up that challenge and I write about inequalities, social inequalities, I try world trade, pollution, big global trends in obesity and ideas about gender. Anyway, you'll have to read it. There's lots and lots and lots of stuff in there. But what I'm trying to do and what the, what the cover of the book, the big container ship suggests is um, kind of engage with that challenge of showing how practices spread out, how they amalgamate and adapt, how inequalities build over time and how I mean, some ideas about the nature of connectivity as such. And it's a really weird, I think it's a weird and eccentric book um, in that the range of examples is enormous. I, when I was writing it, I was a bit frightened that the range was too much and, you know, you would feel seasick trying to read it. There were so many different examples. But my various readers have thought it was OK. And the list on the side shows you just something of how eccentric it is like I've got a chapter that starts with a lot of stuff about cistercian winemaking and things like that right but I'm using this all of these examples and materials in order to build a big picture kind of story of change in the social world and the role of the connections between practices in making those kinds of let's say transformations if not transitions I'm going to say a little bit about accumulating so as to make a connection back to sustainability. So, so with accumulating, the question is um, not just how do practices spread, although that's very important around the world. And I've written in other chapters about hybridizing and like merging and relaying and things like that. Um, but I'm interested in, in part of this book in what practice theory brings to the conceptualization of like, um, well, you couldn't, I mean, in science technology studies terms, you could call it path dependence. And I'm not against that language. Um, the practices leave residues. They leave their mark on the world in all kinds of ways, including the buildup of carbon emissions in the atmosphere. They are outcomes of many practices, including the distribution of plastics on land and in the ocean. They're outcomes of practices too. So if we start from that, we can then begin to think about the modes and forms of accumulation out of which climate change is made, for example, and presumably out of which climate change could be addressed as well. So in simple terms, that means asking slightly different questions, not, um, not just how to reduce carbon emissions, or at least the way to get to that, is by thinking which practices exactly underpin carbon emissions. How did they come to be? How do they combine? What are their separate histories? Because unless you can get to that, you're just dealing with, as it were, you're slicing out a little part of just technologies or you know, just the energy system or something like that. And that's simply not enough to engage with practice theory and transitions and sustainability. So if you want to go on and, and go back, I mean, I already mentioned air conditioning, but here's another example. If you wanted to think about global energy consumption, you would do well to think about what practices and combinations of them make air conditioning normal. This is a fantastic picture. It was taken, I think, in Singapore, and you'll notice a fine display of air conditioning units, and you will also notice the open window. It's weird. It's got all kinds of transitions going on here. Um, but it's also got very different ideas of comfort and well-being and modernity that you simply cannot squash into a nation state figure like the Frank Gill's picture, if that was a nation state at all. 
you have to think about Tokyo and Milan and America. You have to get into the detail of how ideas of comfort circulated and changed, I would say, in order to get anywhere with understanding the sustainability or unsustainability of demand for these kinds of technologies. The distribution of air conditioning is not the same as the distribution of microplastics, and it depends how broadly you define sustainability, but I'm quite interested in plastics. They're very durable. They've only existed for a few generations and they are accumulating because they are so durable, uh, not equally in different parts of the world. So this is a shot of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is where the ocean currents kind of condense and concentrate plastic particles. And these patterns are partly climatic, partly to do with wind and, and water, um, but they're also much more complicated by exactly what are the residues of practices here. So it turns out that different kinds of bacteria are now traveling the world because they latch on to plastic particles. This is quite unintended consequence. And I don't think you can capture these kinds of transformations in a multi-level perspective for various reasons. Um, certainly not this concentration kind of issue, which is quite geographical and social, which is quite, quite a challenge. Anyway, there's plenty more, but um, to do a bit of a summary, I'm saying the key thing about taking practices, what people say, what they do, as the central unit of inquiry distributed over space and time, includes technologies, materialities, resources, infrastructures, appliances, residues. So it, it's not excluding any of that, but it's providing an account of change, which is not punctuated equilibrium, like transition theory. It's absolutely ongoing. There's never a moment without change in the world of practices. There are many sources of dynamics, um, including other practices, different elements of practices, and there's no one directional path. So that S curve has always got arrows going up. I can't see, I just can't make sense of that in these terms. Practice theory has great ideas about becoming large and extent and spatiality and duration. Um, and all of these terms, accumulation, connections between practices seem to hang together to me. In terms of agency, people, bigger, not as sources of change, but as carriers of practices. Policy has no special role, unlike in transition theory. We not, would not have a separate box for policy. Policy is part of the world of practices. There's no inevitability or consistent direction in this account. I think some of the enduring puzzles are about actually a connection in a way with transition, conceptualizing alignment and condensing understanding mutual reinforcement and also understanding breakdown and disappearance and fossilization and variation in practices. So there's still, I'm not saying this is a finished agenda, neither of them are, but these are the directions to go in next. So now like the last, we're heading towards the last part. Um, what, what have we got to say about the differences or similarities between these, these traditions? Well, one, um, the flat ontology, I'd say, where there is no difference, no separate realm of the economy that bears down on the strategic niche of small innovations or the detail of what we do. Actually, everything is practice. The economy is made of practices. No separate ideas are needed in practice theory. In transition theory, there is a need for big external explanations in some senses Market forces are drivers. Infrastructures are drivers. The economy is a driver. So that's the language. Keeping with that language, the landscape is a change, is an outcome of the regime. The regime is an outcome of different niches and one layer kind of bears down or up both ways on the other. But for a flat ontology, there are no layers. It doesn't make sense to have them. And that doesn't prevent big explanations, but it completely changes the terms in which they are understood, as I've tried to hint at and indicate. So this is the same story in a kind of picture form. Um, 
various people, including Frank himself, have said this is not a hierarchical model, but I would disagree because I think you just have to draw the band across the middle and see that it is made of layers. That's the whole point, basically. One, the landscape developments, see these layers, you know, the, and the arrows connecting the layers go back and forth. That's how change is understood to work. Now, this is another version of the multi-level model um, with a bit more hesitation, a few more dots in the lines here. Um, but I'm thinking, what happens if we just squash the layers, just flatten it like that? So I've shown halfway squashing, which is inconceivable, but the flat ontology shows the single plane of practices. So I think there's movement between these, but I think at the moment they're really very different ways of conceptualizing change in the world. I think there's also some really big differences in policy implications. So there's no shortage of policy toolkits inspired by transitions theory and by the traditions and heritage from which that theory, on which that theory draws. Steering, directions, transitions to a lower carbon society. Power is understood to lie outside the socio-technical system and make a difference to where it goes and how it goes. And that's why there's so much attention given to policy, et cetera, et cetera. Practice theories, first of all, recognize there's huge variation in situations and in the dynamics of practice. It recognizes that policy is part of the world of practice, not outside it. Steering, such as it is, is not a matter of picking a direction, but of being part of the multiple winds and currents of practice dynamics. It's about recognizing that transitions, if you like, are occurring all the time and in many directions endogenously, indeterminately, and there isn't one controllable direction. And that power, very important concept, is nothing other than a product of the histories of practice. It's not outside of that. You see what I mean? Now that, although that's what I think, um, that's definitely not stopped people, in this case, Sam Hampton, from having a go at what I think is a completely impossible job of mishmashing, mixing, blending the hierarchical levels of transition theory with the elements of practice theory. And I just think this makes no sense whatever. And hopefully from what I've said this far, you would figure out why I think it makes no sense whatever. It's mixing sets of concepts that are associated indelibly with a flat ontology, with sets of concepts that are indelibly associated with a hierarchical ontology and it's trying to pretend something can happen in between. I, I think this is wrong. That's why I've written no in big letters. Um, the next thing that happens a lot, and maybe some of you subscribe to this, we're going to find out quite soon, um, is to say, well, actually, what I've described are just two different lenses different ways of seeing the world. You could go for the practice theory lens, or you could go for the multi-level model transition theory kind of lens. So I've adapted a very nice picture of the practice theory lens here to show these different possibilities. Now, well, and, and this is a very common way of thinking about social theory. You just pick up one lens. It's like in your put, putting on a new pair of spectacles and you see the world differently and you change your spectacles and you see the world differently again. There's no difference really. Now, the problem with that interpretation is that it supposes the world is there, out there, and all that changes are the spectacles. But I say no, because I'm, like, I'm a sociologist. I say no, actually, you can't separate the spectacles from the world. Um, theories are about ways of seeing. So there isn't really one real world out there. It's a product of our understanding of it. This is not new, but. It's important to restate it. And what theories are good for is shaping the kinds of questions and how the social material world is understood. So these are actually different worlds, basically. It's not one lens or another lens on the same world. I mean, we could argue about that for a long time, but that's that's where I'm that's where I'm coming from. Um, so these are these are real strong points of difference, but I don't want this to be just kind of talk about we can't go there. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
there are some shared ancestries. There are points of commonality. So I'm going to end um, with, with some commenting on them. As I've said, there's no one driver in varying different ways, both ways of thinking about the world suppose multiplicity. They both suppose the material and the social are absolutely interwoven, and they're both kind of evolutionary. In other words, the outcomes of the path shaped the future. That is common to both. And funnily enough, if you go back prior to Frank's appropriation of the multi level model, go back to Ari Rip, who came up with this diagram years before, you'll notice these arrows going back and forth between all of the levels, actually. And if that's not an invitation to a flat ontology, it's not going there quite, but you can see it's kind of implying the squashing that I talked about earlier, um, or at least it, it points to there might be some common ground there. Um, the, next, the next slide is, is even more challenging looking to the future. I think practice theories um, hint at the very nature of connectivity and society changing. So the first picture is allegedly of some Neolithic uh, kind of population arriving along the shores of Britain. And like the movement of ideas and technologies in the Neolithic period was based on physical mobility. That's a whole way of connecting practices. So any kind of transitions or change was based on the physical encounter of people. It's difficult to imagine now, but that's true. Then writing and the historians are very keen on writing, arguably made it possible to act at a distance for all sorts of different connections to exist, for records to be kept, for example. And then the picture on the right is the digital era where lots of different, yet more different kinds of connections can be made. And Karen Norsatoon has written about microstructures and so on. Now, understanding the nature of connectivity as such uh, it's not just a question of technology. It's not encompassed by the multi-level model, but it's arguably crucial to understanding things about sustainability or how it changes and what, how it's made. Um, so this is also unfinished business, but these are really big topics in society and social theory, uh, which I think an account of transitions in practice, if such a thing should exist, would be well, well up for um, understanding. So to go back to the title, does it make sense to think about transitions in practice? Yes, I think so. But not by trying to combine fundamentally incompatible theoretical traditions. So we should respect theories for what they are. We shouldn't try and do that sort of multi-level version of practice theory. That really is a mixture. Um, transitions theories do not deal with the unit of social practices. They deal with units of technology and innovation. Practice theories do not deal with the level models of explanation and change, but they can be used to understand spatial and temporal aspects of how practices combine, evolve and disappear and do so at scale. So I don't think I'm not arguing for a mixture, but I'm arguing for recognising where the, some of the similarities come from. Um, but I don't think there's a combination that's possible. So that's what I had to say. <laughs>